I'm here today to talk with you about de-extinction. And I expect that most of us, when we hear that word, if we think about that word at all, think of Jurassic Park. But I want to say today that de-extinction in the real world is both more interesting and more consequential than the movie could ever have been. This is a potentially game-changing innovation in wildlife conservation, and we desperately need game-changing innovations in conservation because the news on the extinction front is very grim. I want to start with a roll call of a few notable, relatively recent extinctions. This is the South African quagga. This was a subspecies of zebra that was extinct by 1883. The settlers, the colonial settlers to South Africa, felt that it competed with their introduced livestock for grasslands, and they also really enjoyed hunting it. This is the American passenger pigeon. The last known passenger pigeon died in Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. Only 80 years earlier, James Audubon had written a flock of passenger pigeons that would darken the skies for days as they flew overhead. And there were an estimated 3 billion passenger pigeons in North America. Closer to home, this is the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylacine. When colonial settlers first reached Australia, they actually did not have a taxonomic category for this animal. They feared it, they thought it was strange, and they also believed that it decimated their sheep farms. So the government began a deliberate extermination campaign, and by 1930, the species is extinct in the wild. And the last thylacine that we know of dies alone and unlamented in Hobart Zoo in September of 1936. And finally, this is an artist's rendering of a woolly mammoth. Now, we don't know why the woolly mammoth died out all those thousands of years ago. It may have been climate change, it may have been an infectious disease epidemic, or it may have been overhunting. What we do know is that because of global warming, there are woolly mammoth carcasses now popping up all across Siberia. And some of these carcasses have viable DNA in them. Unfortunately, we also know that we are standing on the brink of a sixth mass extinction event. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature estimates that the extinction rate as we sit here is 100 to 1,000 times higher than the natural baseline rate. We have global warming, we have overpopulation, we have industrialization and habitat destruction. And all of these problems are combining to create a situation in which the Earth is unable to recover its natural bounty. So we need answers, and we need them pretty quickly. And that takes us to de-extinction. In the simplest of terms, de-extinction refers to the use of advanced biotechnologies to attempt to bring back extinct species. There's also the goal with de-extinction advocates of what we call ecological enrichment, attempting to reintroduce lost genetic information into the global genome so that the Earth can recover to a pre-modern level of biodiversity, health, and vitality. Some of the techniques that could potentially be used in de-extinction today are cloning, ancient DNA analysis, and genome sequencing. For example, if you could find an intact cell with DNA from a specimen of a thylacine preserved in a museum, or perhaps from a fossil, you could use a closely related surrogate species such as the Tasmanian devil and attempt to bring it back in the laboratory. If cloning is not possible for any particular species, Rapid recent advances in genome sequencing, such as CRISPR, open up a whole new world of possibilities for genome editing. For example, 
we might be able to take the woolly mammoth genome and splice it into the Asian elephant genome. After some pretty tense lab work, the resulting hybrid could be 99% woolly mammoth. And for most of the people that work in de-extinction, this would be considered close enough to be a species resurrection. We should also note that there has been one individual of an extinct species that has already been brought back. In 2003, scientists in Europe, using skin cells that had been preserved in a closely related species, brought back the Pyrenean ibex, which had been declared officially extinct in 2000. The resulting ibex clone only lived for seven minutes, and it died, apparently, of a normal respiratory illness. Now, for critics, that's a problem. And another problem for critics is that because the skin samples were so recent, bringing back the ibex tells us nothing about all of the challenges we would face in bringing back a Pleistocene mammal, such as the woolly mammoth. But I believe that if we consider the fact that to this point, extinction has been considered final, forever, irrevocable, then the ibex experiment is a significant step on the way to de-extinction. In fact, as a social scientist, the thing I find most fascinating about the de-extinction project is that it is on the verge, potentially, of turning extinction, which in the 20th century was a scientific or political problem, into an engineering problem. Now, it's going to be one hard engineering problem. But with the right people, smart investments, the right tools, smart policies, engineering problems are imminently solvable. And this may be why many of the advocates of de-extinction like to say that it is this generation's moonshot. But to say that it's this generation's moonshot is not just to put our emphasis on the technological bells and whistles. De-extinction, should it work, is going to pose extraordinary political, social, and ethical questions that I think all of us have a stake in. It would fundamentally change our relationship to nature. And I think we all have both a right and an obligation to consider these issues now before we're confronted with a passenger pigeon or maybe even a woolly mammoth. So to start with the downsides, for critics, however magnificent it might be to see a woolly mammoth walk across the tundra again, this is really science as spectacle. It lets us take all of the difficult political, social, economic issues that are at the root cause of the extinction crisis and just shove them over here and put our faith in that technological fix. There's also the problem of what economists refer to as moral hazard. If we truly begin to believe that bringing back an extinct species is as easy as fiddling around with some DNA samples in a lab, why would we worry about them going extinct in the first place? Related to this is the problem, the moral hazard, that the consequences of thinking that this becomes easy could be catastrophic for those species that are today endangered. There's also the problem of opportunity cost. De-extinction is expensive, and research dollars are scarce. Every dollar that is spent on de-extinction is a dollar that is arguably not available for grassroots efforts to save species that are hurtling towards extinction as we sit here. We also have to ask ourselves which species and why. Being human, we have a tendency to be the most interested in those beautiful, charismatic megafauna. Or we're interested in species like the passenger pigeon or the thylacine that tell us something we value about our national histories 
our cultures. Now, whether or not these species are going to be the most important to a functioning ecosystem is an open question. And the scientific and political debate around any de-extinction candidate promises to be intense. Finally, I think we have to consider the ethical and moral problem inherent in bringing back one or two individuals from an extinct species if there's no political and financial will to save them in the wild. Most of the species we want to bring back were pack animals, charismatic megafauna, social animals. To bring back one or two just to shove it in a zoo with its endangered cousins would not only be biologically irrelevant, really, from an ecosystem perspective, but it could arguably be just downright cruel. So why might we think about doing this? After all, Charles Darwin himself, in his masterpiece on the origin of species, told us in 1859, species and groups of species disappear. First from one spot, then from another, and finally from the world. Extinction and natural selection are natural processes that produce the very biodiversity that we cherish. The problem, of course, is that our human activities have accelerated extinction far beyond a rate that is recoverable for the Earth. So, one very strong argument for de-extinction research and support is that we may not have much of a choice. We need answers and we need them quickly. And it is the case that the woolly mammoth, for example, exerted a significant influence on the Siberian steppe. To revive it wouldn't necessarily just be to bring back the woolly mammoth, it could rehabilitate that entire ecosystem. And that, in turn, could have positive effects on climate mitigation. Progress. The story of humanity is the story of technology. De-extinction, even if a woolly mammoth proves a dream too far, is tied up in a much larger research agenda that has to do with human health, evolution, and the life sciences. We will learn an extraordinary amount. Finally, I think we can turn the ethical position on its head. Where we humans are responsible for a species going extinct, when there's nothing natural about it, perhaps we can argue that we should use every tool at our disposal to attempt to bring it back. I think de-extinction, though it will be difficult and there's many research hurdles left to cross, is one of the most interesting ideas in conservation today. It is science as aspiration, it is science as hope. And yes, we need the scientists, and yes, we need the engineers, and yes, we need the ethicists and the philosophers. But I think all of us have a stake in how de-extinction could shape our relationship to the future of nature. So I encourage all of us to take an interest in these developments, and I hope that all of you feel confident about participating in these future discussions. Thank you. <laughs>